This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Happy New Year and welcome to episode 36 of Cooking with Greek, our first one of 2020. That's right, we're inexplicably in the 20s. There's no Gatsby, no Great Depression. I know, that. that's not true. There is a Great Depression. <laughs> this show. <laughs> yeah. I'm Chris, and as ever, I'm joined by my co-host, who is also called Chris, who just jumped in slightly early, but we'll let that slide. Hello. In 2020, I'm going to be premature in all things I do, including love talking making. over the intro. Oh, not love making. <laughs> For those new listeners in this new decade, which I am still not ready to experience, because seriously, how are we in the future? This is definitely like, there should be flying cars, there should be robots, and nope, here we are, we just have Twitter and Facebook. Anyway, sorry, I've gone off track. (laughs) For any new listeners, the way this podcast works is myself and my co-host have each brought two surprising and weird topics to titillate, interest, and otherwise Sate your curiosity for the weird and wonderful. And on that note, over to Chris for his first topic of the decade. So, as you said, for my first topic of the decade, I'll ask you a question, as I always do. Chris, what do you do every day that you think is perhaps higher than the average person? Anything you do (laughs) an abnormal amount? Well... Um, is it make love? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we'll go with we'll go with make love, vigorous self love. Yeah, <laughs> let's. <laughs> no, maybe. Who knows? I like to keep everyone guessing. Um, more than the average person, I reckon that I get distracted more than the average person because, as you are well aware, I cannot focus at all and have to take regular breaths. So when I'm working, like some people can sit there work through lunch, I get up every like five minutes, <laughs> have a wonder. <laughs> All right, why do you ask? I was just making small talk. I thought in this new era we'd just have a small talk podcast. No, it works for me. No, it's um, because Victor Hugo... Oh, yes. ...who wrote Les Miserables and The Unchback of Notre Dame... Yeah. ...among other things, arguably had more sex than anyone else in his life. That's a bold claim. It's a bold claim, which I will now attempt to back up. Who made the claim? Did he make the claim or...? Just... uh, sort of historians and biographers oh, okay. over the years. The all-time shaggers, you're probably thinking of Genghis Khan. He's uh, got to be up there. To be fair, I, I'm not entirely sure how much of Genghis Khan's conquests were consensual. It's true. probably quite easy to get laid on if the answer is no on pain of death. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm-hmm. So, But but yeah, a lot of sex. Yeah. Um, so there's him. There was a guy I knew at uni who went by Slag Delicious Pete. Which is weird because his name was Simon. Um, <laughs> but Victor Hugo apparently, um, well, he had so much sex that his official biographers, and as a side note, isn't it nice to, or wouldn't it be a nice idea to be so famous during your life that you have biographers just. Yeah, you have an <laughs> official one as well as unofficial ones, ones trying to like, get on, on the whole sweet biography dollar. Yeah. I look forward to the or cooking with grief <laughs> as a biography. Yeah, it's just me and you. Right, you know, he's just staring at me. He's just eating a biscuit. Um, it, well, he had so much sex that his official bi- uh, biographers just lost count. Um, it was reported he fucked uh, anywhere between three and nine times a day. Oh, that is... That's a lot. It's just time consuming. It depends how long you last. If it's a, a single oh. thrust, that's only nine thrusts. True. But I mean, like, because you have the, you know, the whole refract- refractory period to, you know, sort of recharge. Mm. I mean, yeah, three, yeah. I mean, nine. <laughs> oh. I mean, nine on like a honeymoon, fair enough. But every, if that's like your average, every, every, you know, every day. So let's put it at one woman or, or multiple women or what? Very multiple women. Okay. Very, that was great English. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying you can. <laughs> Buku de. <laughs> Buku de. <laughs> Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> Beaucoup de mange. <laughs> um, he kept a sex diary written in Latin code, because why not? <laughs> I was going to say, I, sex diary. I, 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 I. <laughs> sex diary. V, 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 v. <laughs> I was going to say, sex diary. Creepy. Sex diary in Latin. Yeah, touch of class. <laughs> oh, an educated pervert. <laughs> 
And Has it, anyone considered that maybe he was lying in his own private sex diary? Well, it's it's possible. There is a, a fact to come which might lay, uh, give credence to uh, these claims. But in this um, diary, he did distinguish between official and unofficial mistresses. Again, is this like the biographers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like a d- sort of distinction without a cause, really, isn't it? It's like, are they all mistresses? But possibly one of the reasons we know... Well, there's lots of you know accounts from... Basically, the whole population of Paris. <laughs> so, not only he was, you know, he was a frequent shack, but on the day his funeral in 1885, pretty much all the brothels closed because there were so many prostitutes coming to mourn him oh. that they had to close down business for the day. And two million people attended his funeral. That's a lot. For, like, it's not a bad thing. haven't shagged all of them. Possibly not, but... Sounds like a... Uh, he might have had a bit of an addiction there, Chris. I mean, I don't know how much money there was writing novels in Paris in them days. Probably a fair amount. Uh, quite, I think had, quite a lot. He had if... fame during his lifetime. Yeah, and I think if you write... But if he's spaffing yeah. it all on prostitutes, then... Uh... So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> he's just ejaculating his hard-earned... Uh, money. What? <laughs> <laughs> what of cash? His loads of cash. <laughs> but the thing is, right, Les Mis and Hunchback, big, chunky books. Mm-hmm. How the fuck do you have time to shag nine times a day and write, and write them? I know. Like, yeah, presumably, writing was his day job, I guess. So, I don't know how you say it. Would but, I mean, do, would you... Let's say you had to have sex with nine different people throughout the day. Yes. And just, like, the act of, you know... But it, it's always at a brothel or something. So that you can so travel times. times, yeah. Yeah, so let's say 10 minutes either side. Either you try and get all your writing done in the morning and go, right, and now for an afternoon of shagging. Yeah. Then a nap. Then some evening More shagging. Second. Yeah. Or do you try and space it out like coffee breaks? Oh, I'd you, space it out. Do you like, think it's, always like a writer's tip? I've already you know, just you, said earlier that I need more yeah, distractions. True, so, you yeah. know, I'd write a bit, go for a shag. Write a bit, go for a shag. Mm. Write a bit. It's like his shag. reward for getting two pages done. Yeah. And he's not used it. He's only written one sentence, but it's all... He, he had very long sentences. Oh, uh, fair enough. I've never read any of his. All oh, right. Like, I think, I think Lermes has got the record for the longest continuous sentence. That it's all like... Oh, like colon and subclause, 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 like aside in hyphens okay. and brackets and... I almost saw his house. <laughs> <laughs> what an anecdote. That's Tell a, me more. That's as close as I've got to Victor Hugo. Okay, was it almost nice? It was. I was okay. in Paris, did and it, it was nearby. How were the bed sheets? Oh, oh, I don't know, I didn't, oh, didn't yeah. see. They got it. Well, well, now I know what to look for. <laughs> if you go in the black light, and it just blinds you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's gross. Like, yeah, I mean, this, this is an adult podcast thing. I can say that, you know, sex can be alright sometimes. Understatement. Of the <laughs> but carry on. It's It's fine, I guess. If you're into that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. But nine times a day. Like... It sounds exhausting. Yeah. I mean, so unless it unless it lasted a very short amount of time. Or oh, he didn't do much else during his day. You'd be sore by that stage. <laughs> do you think maybe he saw himself as a professional shagger and he just wrote the books <laughs> as a hobby? And he just it just looked out that he's the most, some of the most influential books of all time. Yeah, maybe. He certainly wasn't miserable. <laughs> Maybe he did have a hunchback though from all the shagging. <laughs> Maybe he was the hunchback of Notre Dame. So that's the end of my first topic for this episode. Chris, what's your first one, please? Okay, well, I'm going to start off in a slightly dark place, but what would you say is the worst thing about war? The films that they make about it afterwards. Well, I'd say that's one of the highlights because you can get some absolute crackers like uh, Apocalypse Now. But anyway. I would have thought, you know, it would have been all the human death and misery. Oh, the loss of innocent lives. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you about some wars, because as always, when I ask you to help set me up, you always <laughs> fail to meet that. <laughs> Let's get <it> again. <laughs> um, but yeah, some wars that nobody died. Ooh. List of what are called bloodless wars. First one I was going to talk about was the Anglo-Swedish War. It's the only time Britain and Sweden have ever been at war. I mean, not including, like, Viking raids mm. or anything like that. Well, apparently, the UK and Sweden were actually allies for a long time. But then, 
Sweden lost a war in Finland and they were forced to declare war on the UK, on, on the side of Napoleon. But they didn't actually want to and they didn't even, uh, yeah, were, they were at war for two whole years and they didn't fight a single battle. They didn't stop the British from stationing any ships nearby. <laughs> And the only casualties were 30 when um, a group of farmers who wanted to not be part of the army had to desert and the Swedish shot them. <laughs> well, okay, so they were so, on their own side. Though, so, yeah. yeah, so it wasn't entirely bloodless. There were 30 killed, but they were killed by their own side. Yeah, yeah. Um, which just seems to be murder with extra steps when <laughs> you're just shooting your own side when there's not even a war really going on. But, yeah, so that that's one. There's also the pig war. <laughs> so called because that... the only casualty was a pig. Oh right, so but it was like humans versus pigs. It wasn't no, no. Pig, pig no. kingdoms. Well, it was what like a uh, hogs of war. Yeah, which, yeah, a classic game. Oh, no. but no, it was humans versus humans. The British right. versus America, actually, eighteen fifty nine, uh, where be, there were some disputed islands uh, between Alaska and Canada. And what happened was a pig wandered over and started eating some American farmers' potatoes, and the farmer got upset and shot it. But the pig was owned by an Irishman who was back then in Ireland, with the, you know, it was all the kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and he was unsatisfied by the offer of compensation uh, for the pig, and then tried to get more money from him and then the farmer said well I shouldn't have to pay you anything the pig was on my <laughs> land and then escalated and then British and Americans sent thousands of troops <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there might be a couple of steps in between well the land itself the island was disputed oh right I so see. there was so a bit the, of a talk about who should own it was a catalyst part. pig yeah for the, the conflict it wasn't just the pig but yeah that was the reason why because there was American farmers British farmers yeah, Both yeah. sides said they owned the land. America said they owned it. Britain said it was part of Canada, so they owned it. And then this pig got shot, and then that escalated out of control wildly. And the next thing you know, there's multiple warships and thousands <laughs> of soldiers. Oh, at which point the farmer's going, I think they also shot the pig. <laughs> but yeah, in the end, Britain, they got some third-party arbitrators to decide who owns the island, and they decided it was part of America. And that was that. Oh, that's quite reasonable. <laughs> yeah. It turns out nobody actually wanted to uh, to fight. It took 12 years <laughs> before they finally decided <laughs> who owns it. Next one would be the Kettle War, because the only casualty was a kettle. I mean, in what sense was that? A <laughs> was uh, one shot was fired throughout the war. This one was between the Holy Roman Empire and the Republic of the Seven Netherlands, which I assume was the old name for the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Good yes, assumption. the Dutch Republic. Mm -hmm. And this was back in the 18th century. And on this particular case, there was one shot fired and it hit a kettle. <laughs> and we're classing that as a casualty. Cause, well, no, it's not a casualty. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if it had a hole in it, then you couldn't use it again. Ting. So yeah, as far as wars go, those are probably the best ones. Yeah. And then there was also a time when the Isle... Isles of Scilly, off the Cornish coast in Britain, mm -hmm. was apparently at war with the Netherlands for 335 years. <laughs> what, really? <laughs> but nobody knew why. <laughs> <laughs> the, the entire war is disputed. <laughs> but I think it was a lack of a peace treaty uh, between <laughs> Britain and the Netherlands, but somehow didn't include the eyes of Skilly. <laughs> we're still at war. No, we're not. Yes, we are. No, we're not. Right, I'm going to war her over this. Told you. <laughs> so in the 350 years, but there was no battle for no... No, it was as part of the uh, the English Civil War. Mm -hmm. Royalists held the Isle of Skilly, whereas the Navy was... The parliamentarians had a... Uh, they were allied with the Dutch. Mm -hmm. which meant the Isles of Scilly were at war with the Dutch, and then <laughs> they never signed the paperwork to say they weren't anymore when yeah. the parliamentarians took over. So they just ticked the wrong box, or failed to tick the right box. Yeah. yeah, which effectively meant that they were not at war, and it was only in 1986 <laughs> the peace treaty was formalised. <laughs> Someone just found something in a drawer and going, hang on a minute. Yeah. 
Whoa, what? Whoa. <laughs> I mean, I've never been to that, those islands, but I don't think there's much there at all. I mean, I feel no, like I it's... I've not been either, but... Yeah. I mean, what you're saying is easily forgettable. Yes. Like, in the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. There was also a thing on a similar note, wouldn't have been bloodless, but that Berwick upon Tweed in Northern England was mm. at war with France for hundreds of years. Specifically Berwick upon Tweed. Because... Well, as legend goes, I think it may have been disproven. But the legend goes, because Berwick is, for uh, our listeners, Berwick Pontweed is right on the border with, between England and Scotland. So back in the day when times were less harmonious and there were um, invasions and counter invasions and whatnot, it changed hands quite a few times. And in fact, Berwick Pontweed's football team is the only team in England that plays in the Scottish football leagues. Oh, that's an actual fact. That is an actual fact. So yeah, it, like I say, sometimes it was part of Scotland, sometimes it was part of England, and apparently in a treaty, it was, or oh, sorry, a declaration of war, it was mentioned separately to England and Scotland. It was like England, Scotland, and Berwick upon Tweed, because they couldn't decide which one it was, mm. declares war upon France, and then when they eventually did the Peace Treaty, it was like, England and Scotland are now at peace, and they missed out Berwick upon Tweed. Law technicalities meant the French could massacre <laughs> people at Berwick upon Tweed with impunity. In England going, well, well it's on a peace treaty, what do you want? Well, there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, those are some, uh, well, that one wouldn't have been a bloodless war. No, but... But yeah, some previously bloodless wars. I mean, back to your original question, prefer those wars, mm-hmm. arguably more... Well, I was going to say arguably more boring films. I kind of want to see the film about the pig that escalates a <laughs> 12-year war. I know. You just imagine just seeing like all these warships turn up and being like, I <laughs> should <laughs> not have shot <laughs> waking so much balls from your mouth going, shit, might have overplayed me hand here. <laughs> okay, so for my second topic, I will start off with a question, as I increasingly pretty much always do. Chris, what is the best thing about modern life? I am a big fan of not dying of dysentery while still a child. Yep, big one. And the worst thing? Worst thing is not dying of dysentery while still a child, because <laughs> <laughs> it's been all downhill since then. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I'll go, best thing, the Greg's chicken tikka uh, slice. Worst, worst thing, that. Piers Morgan. Yeah, fair. Right, well, before, on previous episodes of Cooking with Greek, we've talked about work-life balances and going from students with lots of free time to working full-time, like how much that impacts your life. There are lots of benefits of not being a medieval peasant. Yes. Like you mentioned, not dying of dysentery Mm -hmm. in childhood. But I think the modern conception of medieval peasant life is that while we have vaccinations and stuff for the time being, that they worked so much harder. Yeah. And it's it's not quite accurate that although obviously toiling in the fields and sort of more sort of agrarian jobs mm-hmm. are more physically demanding, they had a lot more time off than us. For example, the they worked only up to half the year and the church enforced frequent mandatory um, breaks. Yeah. They're encouraged to take a week off of weddings, wakes, and births. Mm-hmm. And regularly they got time off when entertainment or sport came to town, so a circus or what they called mummers. Mummers. Oh yeah, I'm like the yeah, actor type. Yeah, yeah like so, yeah, sort mom. of clown slash yeah. plays. Yeah. Um, or like jousting tournaments or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And you got Sundays off and um and then obviously time to rest off harvest season. During the fourteenth century, English peasants worked no more than hundred and fifty days a year. Oh, that's not too bad. That's pretty... Pretty good. Pretty good. Obviously, hard days, yeah. but not that many. By contrast, the modern American worker gets an average of eight vacation days a year. That is terrible. But I assume the average American worker also gets weekends off as well. Yes, that's true. So that's, they're still working yeah. twice as many days yeah, as, no. as, a, as a peasant. Yeah, so... And, and also, days. that doesn't take into account the difference between sort of European and American work culture. We have it enforced in law that we've got minimum Yeah, yeah, off. and, you know, like maternity leave and paternity leave and yeah. sick breaks and and holidays and stuff like that. How did, how did that happen? Like, how have we got so used to just being like, oh, yeah, I don't need to 
I don't need the extra time off. I'm, I'm doing fine. Yeah, and I think that's the, the sort of the work ethic thing I was trying to talk about. That we feel like if oh if we're not having a complete breakdown, then we we don't you know shouldn't take the time off. Like whereas we should. Yeah, we should all take the maximum time we get. Oh yeah, I want to say I just not needed, and I'm not one of those types. I mean, I'm sure our listeners can probably tell from the tone of this podcast I'm not the type of person who feels the need to overwork myself like I work with somebody she gets up at 5.30 in the morning to start work and she's working till 7 she doesn't get yeah. paid any extra if the hours were on with salary so it's just mad at least if my liege lord declares war on somebody I don't have to join his army <laughs> so, you know, we're going to France what's France <laughs> also why are you speaking modern English <laughs> yeah I know what you mean like I'm the point of my topic is not how much easier medieval peasants had it yeah. <laughs> than than either us just, or we think. Just that the the conception is, you know, like toiling all the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's not quite as I can't remember oh, the exact number, but it's a similar thing, you know, with hunter gatherers. We again we assume that it's a I mean obviously it's, it's not an easy life again, mm. but we assume that it must be you gather and you hunt. And if you don't, you die, so you're doing it all day, every day. I think somebody studied some modern, let's say, uncontacted tribes, obviously contacted, but you know, the ones that still retain their traditional way of living. And I can't remember the exact hours, but it's only something like 10 hours a week or something like that. It's a lot less than the it's, average yeah. of work, so to speak, because hunting, you hunt one thing, it might take a day of hunting, but then that will feed you for a good few weeks, whatever, and then you'll gather some. Food yeah. or firewood or whatever, which again, if especially if you're in the jungle or something, there's plenty around. Uh, so a lot of it's spent basically chilling. Like. Yeah. Well, one article I read, sort of related to the topic, was yeah, it quoted sort of between ten and fifteen hours. Oh, is it? Yeah. And obviously, the rest of the time is basically socializing. It's mm-hmm. it's shagging, yeah. you know, and then just hanging around. <laughs> with Victor Hugo would have loved it. Would have loved it. It's like, what? <laughs> All day to for shacking? What else is there? And not a petticoat in sight. And it's like, uh, the other problem is uh, we don't have a written language, so <laughs> you, you know, your only talent is otherwise pointless. Hope you're good with a bow. <laughs> Damn it, it's the contrast of writing poetry and shacking that makes me so great. Yeah. Obviously, it's something to think about as we move into this brave new decade of mm. the Roaring Twenties, although it's not much of a roar, it's the Whimpering Twenties. <laughs> um, so John Maynard Keynes, who was one of the founders of modern economics, predicted by 2030 that leisure time would be so abundant that it would characterise national lifestyle, in that technology and sort of, well, the, you know, modern life would be so sort of self-reliant that we would basically be free all the time. For all the time. It's kind of got a point in that media and <sighs> entertainment is one of the major... The economy of media and entertainment and all that is huge in a way that, you know, it hasn't really been seen for ever. Yeah. But, yeah, we work more. Because, yeah, the whole working thing, I think it comes down to, uh, obviously, yeah, the Industrial Revolution... And then people were just like, well, factories can run 20 minutes. Like, do you need the sun and the seasons for a factory to work? No, so get, work, get working. And then they had to enforce like breaks. Yeah, our working day. Yeah, because yeah. they had Sundays off because of God. And then it, and then Saturdays they work. But then they started giving Saturday afternoons off, which is why football matches traditionally start at 3 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon because that was enough time for everybody to finish their morning shift at the factory and get to the grounds. Another genuine fact. And there we go. And obviously Sunday was given over to God, so mm. Saturday afternoon was the time for f- football. And then, yeah, then they, I can't remember who it was, but somebody decided that you should only spend, you should spend a third of your life working, a third sleeping, and a third... Other. Yeah, other, so shagging, <laughs> or entertainment, which is why it's eight hour, the eight hour working day came from, was mm. eight hours work, eight hours play, eight hours sleep. Can't remember who it was, though, unfortunately, that's as far as my fact that's goes. That's good. But yeah, that got legislated or whatever and became mm. standard, and that's how we had the eight hour work day. But you're right, because the weird thing with technology is it really should be freeing up people's time, but it doesn't. So I've, I can't remember if I said before on this podcast, but I've said it before or elsewhere, is... I'm an engineer. I can do using Microsoft. Well, I mean, we like use 
Excel even to we can put in, change a few parameters. I can do loads of iterations of a design, which if I had to do in the old days by hand, every time I wanted to change something, I'd have to do this calculation, then the follow-on calculation, yeah. then the follow-on calculation, and everything. Whereas now I just click one, change one cell, whole thing updates. So I can do the work of five, ten engineers in my field from 50 years ago. Yeah. We still work the same. <laughs> the working yeah. day hasn't got significantly shorter since then. Yeah, it's got more efficient, but... Yeah. I think there's just less engineers just, hired in the first place yeah. instead. It's weird. Yeah, so it's a, a tricky one to sort of work out as technology improves. Mm. Does it help everyone uniformly? Probably not. Almost definitely not. Or does it... Helps does a few. It, yep. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of my second topic. Chris, why don't you round us out with your last one? Okay, I will ask a question and hopefully you will set me up this time, but I don't have high hopes. What's the worst thing you've ever drank? I'm not, I'm not trying to think of the answer. I'm trying to think of what answer you want me to give to set you up. So, oh, no, 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 just no, just no, an honest answer. Just an honest answer. Would do. Route one, uh, I've drunk up the compliments of someone I did not trust. <laughs> what do you mean, route one? <laughs> How's that route one? How is that the most obvious thing you could have done? Beer, tried? it's rubbish. How was that? Oh, controversial. But... And I'll tell you what, I just remembered. It's called Shertio, which is a Chinese drink. And it's uh, rice wine in which a snake is pickled inside the jar. That sounds gross. And the guest of honour, in quotation marks, this is an audio medium, gets to bite the head off the snake. Did you bite the head off the snake? I did. It was disgusting. Right. You bit a head off a snake? Yep. Oh, God. I'm looking at you in a different way now. Um... Erotically. <laughs> Please don't say that. Uh, anyway, well, that is marginally better. Oh, then... Um, nice set up, Chris. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> See, I don't know if you're just talking to yourself or like... No, I want to clean Talking to me. Um, no, in Dawson City, Canada, in the Downtown Hotel, which is not the most imaginative of names, <laughs> you can get the Sour Toe Cocktail, which consists of a mummified human toe floating in a shot of whiskey. Oh, uh, whiskey. And if you drink it to uh, qualify for admittance to the Sour Toe Cocktail Club, you have to let the the toe touch your lips. So it's the same toe in every drink? Uh, no. The story came about because somebody lost several toes to frostbite and they decided to donate one. It actually advertises for toes. There's a sign... How is that legal? <laughs> There's a sign in the... Um, in well, they put them in hotels and stuff, saying "Had frostbite? We want your toes." <laughs> and then you can uh, donate your toes to them. You receive a certificate if you drink it and it touches the lips. It's m- m- mummified, you say? Yeah. Well, so it's... frostbitten toes are obviously quite cold. Well, they're dead. Yeah, and whatnot. So this guy, yeah, he did. The world's coldest ultramarathon because some people hate themselves, apparently. Yeah. And he lost three toes to frostbite. Worth it. And so he got them cut and then he asked the doctors if he could keep them. <laughs> yep, yeah, fine. Yeah. He posted them. And his first thought was, you know that bar? I'm yeah. Thinking. The hotels has an in-house toe expert called Terry Lee. And he preserves the digits in rock salt for at least six weeks before serving them. Right. I mean... I feel slightly better knowing that there is a quote unquote professional sort of doing the toe stuff. I, mm. I don't know. I don't know what you prefer. Like, <laughs> oh, I'm just going to stick some toes in salt. Is <laughs> probably. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> but more professional than like it be, than just floating in a pickle jar behind yeah. the bar. Frostbitten toes are apparently rare despite advertising exclusively for them. Ooh, I must try one then. Yeah, no, normally you get them from gout or diabetes. <laughs> Ooh, so you've, you've navigated them. <laughs> the sounds, two big ones. That sounds awful. I mean, um, I know like a dead toe is a dead toe, but I feel like one that you've lost from gout or something must be. That's all, no the, you know, the idea that this guy was trying to get a toe-based cocktail for years and all he had to work with was flimsy <laughs> gout toes and <laughs> yeah. diabetic toes. Yeah, sometimes you get lawnmowers or chainsaw accidents. Not good enough, needs frostbitten. Yeah, well, frostbitten ones are apparently the uh, the ones you really want. And there were, oh, well, actually, sorry, I'll tell a lie. Because earlier you said, is it the same toe? And whilst they do advertise for toes, there are three toes in use. 
So they rotate them out, <laughs> put them back in the rock salt, I guess. Uh, but people do sometimes um, try and steal the toes. I don't know what you'd do once you've stolen the toe. Yeah, I've got a mummified toe. Whoop do you fucking do? <laughs> like, Stick it on a Christmas tree or the mantelpiece. Ooh. Play uh, finger puppets. Hello, I'm Tony. Uh, well, out of curiosity, yeah. I, I don't want to go into your um, various methods. What did you have to Google to come up with this story? <laughs> I don't know, it just came up. Oh, I, fair wasn't, I wasn't searching it out, it just happened to... yeah. Right place, right top. Yeah, exactly. Or well, left top. Left top, yeah. Right. It just... I stumbled upon it because this guy wants to be the first guy to uh, drink his own toe whiskey. Well, well actually, he doesn't actually necessarily himself want to, but the uh, the bar is trying to convince him to become the first guy to drink his own toe drink. Obviously, you don't drink the toe itself, but they don't think anybody's ever taken a shot that had their own toe in there. Which means it's, it's weird that there are so many people willing to donate their toes to things that they have no intention of trying. <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's, a, it's a weird place to like cut it off, go, but obviously I've lost a toe, so I need to donate it to my local bar. Do you want to try it? No. <laughs> no, it's disgusting. You would never drink that. <laughs> but I want you to have it for the people who do. It's very selfless when you think about it. It's odd. And also, I don't ever want to lose my toes to frostbite. All right, if you lost a body part, would you donate it or do anything with it? Like, say you lost body part of your choosing. Okay. Would you don't, what would you lose and what would you do with it? I'd lose a foot and use it primarily for pranks. Oh, good one. Or maybe lose a hand and again use it for pranks, but then I can have lots of sort of hand attachments. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. There's a guy who works my local chippy who's got like a wok attachment and a spatula and a knife and he just. Nice. He just swaps depending on what, what he needs. That sounds like an upgrade. Yeah, it's sort of a low budget uh, inspector gadget. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, the sort of forty eight quid man. <laughs> How about you? What are you? Oh, I don't know. I like like, like a power play, go into biz- business meeting, shake the hand, hand yeah, comes hand away, hand comes off. Exactly, It'd be quite funny. Oh, you know, like you said with the toe. No thing. job, but you know, plenty yeah. of free time. No, yeah, it's like with the foot thing, you know, like stick it in the door to stop somebody, you know, like to hold the door out and then just pull it away and be like, no! <laughs> now buy my Bible! <laughs> really? Is that the thing you tell? A Bible? If you're going to guilt trip people into buying something, go a bit, like, more expensive. I know, I'm trying to think of, uh, there aren't many door-to-door salesmen left. Ah, oh, that's true. That all the, all with the, the uh, internet. And the, and the, you know, online retailer of doors. Yes. Why do you need a new door? Oh, I've got one. Damn. Yeah, I've got a door. Um, whereas the only ones I get are, like, God botherers. Ah, uh, that's fair. And uh, pizza delivery guys, but I think that's part of a prior service. Yeah, unless you uh, lost a finger or something, and then you leave it on the pizza and then give it to people and be like, ha <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I just <laughs> take that back, sorry about that. All right, I think that it was eight times. <laughs> and on that note, we bid thee farewell from this well, having dipped our toe into <laughs> some weird facts in 2020, which I'm still not over. you got to let it go. I'm never going to let it go. I've got a whole decade of this. And then don't even get me started in 2030, when, according to Keynes, we'll all be <laughs> have nothing else to do but sit with our thoughts Ooh, and The lords and ladies of leisure. Exactly. Ladies which Hugo... I don't know what said Hugo Chavez then. <laughs> Victor Hugo will be shagging. <laughs> yeah. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. It's been much the same as the past year, <laughs> to be honest. New decade, new us. Same old shit. Yes. I mean, oh, do you have any resolutions? Let us know on Twitter. Do we do we have any resolutions, Chris? No. Shall we resolve to be more on topic, more prepared, more researched? No. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I say, be yourself. I say, don't change because it's a year. Keep the old leaf. <laughs> it don't change because it might be more profitable or commercially <laughs> successful. No. You know, we're cooking with grief. We don't sell out. I mean, we probably tried to hawk you something before this episode started. And spent the previous 30 episodes begging companies to let us hawk you shit. Yeah, but we're not sellouts and we won't change. Because we've always wanted your money. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note... It's goodbye from me. It's goodbye from me. Enjoy the rest of your year. <laughs> we'll I mean, be- we'll be here every fortnight. <laughs> yes, exactly. But uh, we wish you well. 
And yep, don't forget to check out our Twitter, Cooking with Grief, no G on cooking. And yeah, just leave us a review on iTunes. Let us know that you enjoyed it. Or or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. And uh, check out uh, BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts and more of us. And don't forget to buy our merchandise. But we're not sellouts. (laughs) Yeah, we'll never change. We're not sellouts. Here's five or six things you need to do. (laughs) Well, the review is less of a sellout thing. It's just really nice to know that we're appreciated. And also it helps other people find the podcast, which is super encouraging. Yes, exactly. So tell your friends, share it, tell your enemies, tell anybody, (laughs) tell people on the street, cooking with grief. You'll sound like a madman. <laughs> or woman. Or, or person. Yeah, genderless. Just a mad person. Here's the 20s after all. The roaring... The ro- roaring 20s. The roaring, yeah, inclusive 20s. Exactly. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cooking with Grief. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to recommend it to a friend. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email cookingwithgrief at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. That's at cookingwithgrief. If you'd like to hear more episodes, then please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you've got the time, then it'd be great if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you. All right, everybody on the train, all aboard, you snooze, you lose. Buy my loot boxes. Not you! Get off the train! Don't let him on. Oh, okay. All right, listen here, Greenhorn. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about how to conduct a podcast. First thing you need to know is never stay on topic Ever. Uh, sir. What do you want? Uh, people are complaining about the Venom movie still. I don't care. Feed them Justice League or something. Get them off my back. Copy. But, sir, it says in the book that you need to stay on topic as a podcast. Screw the book, Greenhorn. The book was written by dinosaurs. Second thing you need to know is never report news that's not at least two or three weeks old. Uh, sir. What do you want? People are complaining about the Pokemon Go update. I don't care. Just... Gag them! Or something! Shut them up! On it. Uh, sir? What do you want, Greenhorn? I think the train might be going off the rails. That's exactly how we run this show. This is the Crazy Train of Thought podcast, brought to you by the Idiot Savants. Find us anywhere you listen to podcasts. www.crazytrainofthought.com